Salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland, and this is continuing my series about English law, commonly called common law. Um, and I'm going to focus particularly on the death penalty in the United Kingdom. It's an aspect of criminal law. Well, happily, the death penalty does not exist in the United Kingdom. Well, the death penalty is as old as law itself, and there's only, there's only been, really been history of the United Kingdom, well, before it was the United Kingdom, the territory that's now the UK, going back to Roman times, um, the first century <clears throat> AD, and the Romans uh, had an especial enthusiasm for the death penalty, and indeed considered people being torn apart by wild beasts to be public entertainment, not even necessarily a punishment. So it's there in ancient times for, for all sorts of crimes. Uh, but English law, as we know it, um, are, uh, it, it starts with maybe the Anglo-Saxons, coming over the 5th century AD from what's now Germany and the Netherlands, the Saxony and Germany, the Angles be from what we call the Netherlands really, Jutes as well from Jutland, that's the mainland part of Denmark, or the Jylland they call it. Anyhow, um, they gave us the words England and English, but there were very few written records from that time because they were pagans at first, you know, sacking churches where the writing was going on in Latin. They had their own runes. It was really only from about the 8th century AD that Christianity began flourishing again. And 735 AD, the Venerable Bede, um, up in uh, Jarrow, he wrote his Ecclesiastical History of the English People. And that's the first mention of the words England and English. Um, he was writing in Latin, though. Because England, or Anglia, first of all, they referred to what we now call East Anglia and West Anglia. Roughly the counties Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, um, Cambridgeshire, Huntingdonshire, Northamptonshire, that sort of area. But obviously it's expanded to mean what's now England. Um, anyway, so uh, English law had the presumption of innocence from the earliest times. However, it did not originate there. Hammurabi in um, ancient Babylonia, uh, his code of laws, he uh, stipulated that there was a presumption of innocence. This lawgiver is all but unknown to Occidental um, jurists. So um, a lot of those who are um, Anglophone supremacists and so on will probably be very discombobulated to learn that the presumption of innocence is an Iraqi invention. All right, Iraq as such didn't exist till about 1930, but Babylon was an antecedent state of um, Iraq on the land which is now called Iraq. Uh, anyway, so the um, uh, Angles and Saxons were there, then the Danes came over, more or less where the Jutes had come from about 400 years later. Does, it seems to be not very far apart to us because looking so far back as all the Dark Ages, of course 400 years is a very long time, us looking back to the time of James I. Anyway, and the Danes had their own um, legal system and they had brought in sort of the concept of blood money. If you committed a crime, you'd have to pay some money for that. And if you couldn't afford to, but you'd have to suffer a punishment, a mutilation, like a finger or a toe being cut off. Um, and that's where the expression is, it comes pay through the nose as then have your nose cut off if there's a fine you're unable to pay. And you, if you did a wrong to somebody else, a criminal offence or a civil wrong, the f size of the fine was uh, proportionate to the person's social status. So harming a slave was uh, merited a very small fine, whereas if you um, harmed an aristocrat, a thane, then it was a ruinous fine and so forth. So but they, they still had the death penalty um, for all sorts of crimes. Okay, so uh, then um, when the Conqueror came along, he enclosed forests like the New Forest in Hampshire, and people could be blinded and or castrated for stealing the king's deer, for a second offence executed. It'd be a bit difficult to do it a second time if you got either of those punishments first time around, and either of those punishments might well lead to your death through infection. So people were um, executed for a murder, for blasphemy, for theft above a certain value. Blasphemy is insulting a religion, in this case Christianity. So the usual method of execution was, was hanging, usually by the short drop. So a really horrific death, a poor person strangling. Occasionally the sword having, being decapitated, especially if it was, it was an aristocrat or some sort of military offence. Um, burning unusually, but the person actually died of uh, inhaling smoke. It was asphyxiation rather than the actual flame that killed the person. Hanging, drawing and quartering for treason, which was a gruesome death and um, was just ritual slaying. And so the person half hanged, not to actually kill them, just to cause them terrible distress, and then dragged through the streets backwards because their crime had been retrograde to nature, 
um, across the stones so they'd be, you know, bruised, cut open and so on. Sometimes they put them on some sort of animal hide to not injure them too badly, didn't want them unconscious or just dead by the time they got to the other end. And then um, uh, dismembered, their privities cut off, their head cut off, and that was that. Um, that's why it's quartering, cut into quarters. Um, so this was going on all through this time. For, for minor thefts, people could have some of their fingers cut off. So these were very dark and cruel times. Life was cheap. The 16th century, because of the religious upheavals, uh, there was a, a lot of executions under Henry VIII. He's estimated to have killed about 100,000 people. Some of them in combat because of many rebellions under him. Um, so killed around 3% of the population of England, rather less in Wales and Ireland. Um, just to think that that, that that proportion of people were killed was higher than in the First World War. And by the way, I'm excluding the combat deaths when he sent people to fight in France. So that's how um, uh, tyrannical a monarchy was. I know he has this cuddly reputation as, you know, the merry monarch, merry England, but really he was a savage despot um, and incredibly uh, bloody. And so it carried on. So people being burnt at the stake for heresy, which is professing the wrong religious beliefs, um, executions, which was a kind thing, you could be publicly executed, everyone to see. If he was feeling very lenient, you'd be privately executed. So there's top state prisons of the Tower of London. Only about 16 people were ever executed in the Tower of London, but because they're very high profile people, uh, we, we, many people wrongly imagine it was a huge number. And so it was, it was carrying on like that. Uh, obviously Protestants burnt at the stake under Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary as Protestants call her. Um, Roman Catholics again under Elizabeth I, especially priests, ordinary Catholics not get a, a, a ruinous fine for first offence, second offence, term of imprisonment. This is for organising mass to be said. Finally execution if they wouldn't recant, blah blah blah. <clears throat> so in, in this time and into the 18th century the death penalty was a banality. Um, it was just for what we consider to be misdemeanours, trifling crimes, grand larceny, the theft of over 12 pence. Um, now that was, half, that was half a day's wage for a labourer, sorry, a skilled craftsman, I should say, like a, like a carpenter or blacksmith or something, something of that nature. Um, so what's that in today's money? 50 pounds, more, maybe 100 pounds? So a purse could easily have that amount in it, 12 pence. Put it this way, a good horse was worth five pounds like a top-of-the-range car. Um, so in London, Tyburn Tree was where this happened. It's not actually a tree anymore. Tyburn, it was an underground river, it's now closed over. It's kind of where Speaker's Corner is. There's a little stone in the road in the traffic island near uh, Marble Arch and Edgware Road, and that's roughly where it was. People really were hanged from a tree many centuries ago. Then there was a gallows set up. People would be in Newgate Prison, which is where the Old Bailey is. Newgate Prison was set about 1900. Um, take, uh, they'd be treated to a hellfire sermon the Sunday before they were going to be topped. As though it wasn't dreadful enough, the prospect of having your neck stretched, being told that you were going to go to eternal damnation and that the flames were going to lick you forever as the devil was putting a red-hot poker up your fundament. Um, and then brought down in the tumbrils, these, these wooden carts obviously chained up so they couldn't escape to, uh, to Tyburn Tree, and then it executed to be a carnival atmosphere, crowds of up to tens of thousands watching turnings off, as they call them, the short drop. So people were executed for these small offences, including things like children who were starving, executed for stealing food. It was that barbaric. And that's the staggering thing, how civilization and savagery can coexist. The United Kingdom of the late 18th century, the most technologically and scientifically advanced country in the world, in some ways had a highly sophisticated culture in terms of poetry or architecture and so forth, but yet had these really cruel punishments for what we now recognise as petty crimes of people absolutely desperate and just doing it to stay alive. People can just switch off compassion and say they don't count. Certain categories of people are not people, don't deserve any compassion. It's a tendency that obviously still exists today. So um, people being executed, there's no minimum age. There was a case when a boy of eight was executed and there was a case where a girl of 11 was put to death. So the um, hangman would wear it, would be masked, and one of the purposes of his job was keeping the clothes of the dead. If it was someone who was famous being executed, they might sell them as souvenirs. So there'd be soldiers with their fixed bayonets surrounding the scaffold in case of any attempt to rescue whoever it was. It might be a popular person. Um, the crowd sympathy might be on, on the side of the condemned. Um, 
What else? The person often bled from the mouth and nose as a result of the short drop. People might want to rush forward, dip their hankies in it, blood as a souvenir. This happened when Robert Emmett was hanged on and quartered in Dublin. Um, and one, and the, the, the hangman would then sell the rope, segments of the rope, if people were willing to pay for it. You'd want to buy it there and then, because if you bought it from the prison later, it might not be the genuine article. Um, anyway, so if people bribed the hangman, he would give them a long drop so they'd die almost instantaneously, or let their friend through to pull on the legs to give the person a relatively quick death. It was ghastly. There was one woman they tried to hang and just wouldn't die, so they let her live, um, and they, they, she was known as Half Hanged Nan in Ireland, used to hang people there. A hang woman, the only one I've ever heard of. Or in, in Scotland, a woman was um, hanged in the 17th century for giving birth out of wedlock. Can you believe that? How monstrous is that? For having a child, she's gonna be killed? But anyway, um, and, and, and she wouldn't die, so they let her live. They said, obviously, God wants you to live. That's that. There was one man at the end of the 18th century, sorry, end of the 19th century, and they had to ha try hanging him thrice before he actually died. Um, so uh, the corpses were sent to medical schools because people weren't willing to donate the bodies of their um, beloved to science because, um, you know, the sentence of the court, you'd be buried within the prisoner walls so that the, the body was not the property of the family. It was public property, part of the punishment, the dishonouring nature of, of, of the death penalty. Um, then um, transportation came in in 1788. The first fleet under Captain Cook landed at Botany Bay, that's Sydney. So people would be sentenced to transportation to Australia for seven years or, or up to 14 years, penal servitude. So we'll spare them. Instead of them being uh, put to death, they'll be suffering a fate worse than death, being sent to Australia. Um, and after they did their period of slavery, they'd be set free and they'd be allowed to, ju to just live in Australia, not allowed back, including children being sent out. But a high majority of these criminals were, were men, not women. And some of the British criminals were set free, then married Aboriginal women. Um, if a woman was condemned to death and she was found to have been pregnant, well, she had to convince the matrons in the prison, these middle-aged women who are kind of in charge, uh, said, all right, you are pregnant. So then she wouldn't be executed. They wouldn't wait till she gave birth and then top her. No, that was thought to be perverse. Plus, she needed to breastfeed the child. She would get transportation instead. So um, Sharia law was more merciful at this time. By some estimates, there were 200 capital offences under English law at the time. Forgery, any level of forgery was a death penalty offence. Uh, strong evidence of malice in children. Notice it only had to be evidence of malice. Didn't have to be actual malice that was proved in children. Um, it was staggering and on and on. So the 1820s, Sir Robert Peel was Home Secretary and he um, slimmed down the number of death penalty offences drastically. You couldn't be executed for mere forgery and things like that. No more being executed for grand larceny. Juries who often refused to convict, often they said it was petty larceny because they didn't want the person sent to the gallows. The other thing is, it was very chancy because William IV, the king at the time, uh, he was a compassionate sort. And if, if, if your relative was to be topped and you got an audience with him, you could get a royal pardon. He found it impossible to say no to wailing relatives. So if you, if you got to meet the king, if you got face time, your relative was going to be saved. And some people didn't be able to bribe the right courtiers. And so some people committed murder were spared and those who'd committed grand larceny with some cases were topped. By the 1820s, it was very unusual to be killed for theft, but it did still happen. Um, so anyway, death penalty is obviously carrying on after the 1820s um, and it was in public until 1868. Um, uh, Richard Barrett, uh, a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, was executed for his part in the Clerkenwell explosion a bomb outside a prison wall that killed about a dozen people. And um, he was executed on outside Newgate Prison. There'd be a sort of a scaffold built up or a, or a balcony so the public could see, or elated to see William Calcraft send him to his doom. And Calcraft, he would give them short drops. So they'd strangle, take up to half an hour to die. It was absolutely revolting. Sometimes he'd pull on the legs, climb on them, and just to entertain the baying mob below. Anyway, so... Uh, the number of death penalty offences was falling, not many people, so many people were executed. And then the First World War, well, obviously, firing squad was brought in for desertion face of the enemy. Um, you, you, if you anyway if you away, ran away from your, community, your unit with the potential to permanently desert, would you be topped um, or cowardice in face of the enemy? But it was unusual. You know, about 600 people executed. And obviously, at least 10 times that number were convicted of these offences. Sometimes they were ex executed for the third offence. So... Homicide Act was then brought in in the 1920s, 
saying it had to be for premeditated murder. It couldn't be for crime passionnel, like just losing your temper. Um, and so it, it was used less and less. Marwood, William Marwood was the main hangman in the late 19th century, and he brought in his table of drops, calculating the height and weight, and then figuring out um, how much of a drop the person need to break their neck between is it the second and third vertebrae. So that was that, to try and make it more humane, make it efficient, clinical, and so on, which usually worked. Um, so uh, the Pierpoint family, two brothers, and then the son of one of them, Albert Pierpoint, they carried on this way right into the 1950s. See the last hangman about Albert Pierpoint. It's actually, new, well, it actually wasn't the last public executioner, but nevertheless, Sid Durnley and Mr. Allen and uh, a Stuart, they were all some of the late 20th century hangmen. So abolitionism had been going, certainly amongst particular um, nonconformist churches, the Religious Society of Friends, known as the Quakers, were into that. Lord Soper um, was head of the Methodist Church for a long time. He wanted the death penalty to be done away with. So it was debated by Parliament in the 1930s, but it didn't make any progress. There was a consensus that it should be allowed Churchill, Attlee, and many Labour politicians were in favour of it. Um, but there's some high profile cases after the First World War, which really slimmed down the number of death penalty offences. Timothy Evans wrongly executed for the 10 Rillington Place murders, and there's no appeal from beyond the grave. Derek Bentley, controversially put to death, let him have it, you should see the film about that, for not killing anyone, um, just um, going with a weapon under the common purpose, rule or the law, parties they call the United States. His 16 year old accomplice had committed murder. Bentley was 19. His younger accomplice couldn't be executed. You could only be topped for crimes committed over the age of 18. Bentley was put to death, despite being mentally subnormal. So by the, by the early 60s, there were only about five executions per year. The last one was in 1964, a double execution of two men who'd uh, murdered someone as part of a burglary. Murder and fur furtherance of a robbery would always result in the, the death sentence. Death sentences weren't necessarily carried out. They're quite often commuted, particularly if it was a woman under some extenuating circumstances. The Home Secretary could recommend Her Majesty the Queen exercise the royal prerogative of clemency. The Queen would always go with that, and she would never exercise it if she wasn't encouraged to do so. But Home Secretaries often found it an agonising choice. Ruth Ellis, the last woman hanged, 1954. And Gwilym Lloyd George, the Home Secretary at the time, as in son of the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, he said, no, she must die, otherwise we can never execute a woman again. Moreover, she'd opened fire in a crowded street. Um, she'd, she'd killed her lover, um, but she'd also injured somebody else. Not seriously, but it could easily have been fatal. So then in 1965, a moratorium was brought in, and it was suspended to 1970, and didn't seem to have a significant effect on the number of murders, and then abolished provisionally. Waddington, the Conservative Home Secretary of the 80s, wanted it brought back. Um, Thatcher argued for it in the late 70s. And, you know, had it not been abolished by 1970, it might well have been kept on because of the troubles in Northern Ireland. People were often infuriated about so all the slayings there. Um, so 1998, the European Convention on Human Rights was incorporated into domestic UK law and the UK ruled out bringing it back except in the case of a war or a crisis threatening the life of the nation. David Davis, conservative politician, was been in favour of it recently, but didn't make any particular push for it to be uh, reinstituted. So there we are. I think we made a step forward. I'm very glad the United Kingdom doesn't have the death penalty. Republic of Ireland, we didn't use it for, well, for 10 years before the UK. So I think that makes us a bit more civilised.